You're watching Live Free TV. We're talking about genetically modified organisms. So, my guess, I have one question for you starting off right now. What is a genetically modified organism? Well, your other guess is probably far more qualified <laughs> than myself to to uh, answer that technically. Okay. Um, for from my perspective, a genetically mod well, there's all there's degrees of gen genetic modification, but I think what what people are most concerned about are organisms who have foreign genes spliced into their uh, genetic structure. Mm -hmm. Well, they, that's that's one form of genetic modification. Uh, another one is that you might even decide to do away with a gene. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do that all the time with mice uh, mm -hmm. for experimental reasons, or and in plants, we mm -hmm. take genes out, or we put in a specific gene so that that organism will do something slightly different, mm -hmm. which of course is uh, most people have some familiarity with the Roundup issue. We put a gene into certain crops that resist the Roundup herbicide, and <clears throat> that allows us to spray the crops with that herbicide and it kills all the weeds around the crop without destroying the crop. So that's that's kind of neat. And that's done for things like cotton and okay. I'm, I'm sure some other things too. And those are cases where that is not necessarily, a, it could have been, but it's not necessarily a gene that we took out of something else. Okay? There's some, mm -hmm. in some cases you can actually just say, well we're going to make we're going to make this strip of DNA. Mm -hmm. We may have got the idea from a bacteria or a yeast or something else mm -hmm. to, to make that organism do that particular function. And it's gone the other way too. Uh, there's a lot of people in this country that, that are alive because we have a good supply of insulin to treat diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, what's less well known is that that, that insulin is produced in genetically modified bacteria. We took a human gene and put it in the bacteria. And now the bacteria knows how to make the insulin for us. That's fascinating. Uh, it is fascinating. That is very fascinating. <laughs> so that gets into my question. You're talking about gene slicing and splicing. And now I'm, I'm curious about the progression. We, we have nutrients and food related to these crops. What is the impact to uh, livestock as well as humans who eat genetically modified organisms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, uh, you want to take a... Well, I, I, anything I say on that would be speculative in nature. Okay. okay. I mean, that's, I mean I, I'm going to be honest about this. Yeah. On the other hand, we have seen um, an explosion in uh, autoimmune diseases for instance, over the, basically the, the past generation that just wasn't there. Now, maybe that's due to just keeping people alive who would not have survived in generations past. It could be that simple. It could be something else environmentally that we are inspiring, mm -hmm. and we don't really know the cause of it, I think is a fair thing to that's, say. Yeah. I mean, my mm -hmm. wife, uh, um, one thing I can tell you, for instance, is my wife suffers from... Um, gluten intolerance, celiac okay. disease, yeah. mm -hmm. which itself inspires other autoimmune diseases. It's, uh, we have, and not by genetic modification in the sense that has been described, mm -hmm. but by hy simple hybridization over the years, we have produced uh, wheats that have higher gluten contents yes. because right. it's protein. Yeah. And there are a large fraction of, or a significant fraction of people who cannot tolerate Right. That gluten. Yeah. That gluten that gluten intolerance and ingesting gluten with that intolerance inspires things like diabetes. Uh, my wife has you know, a, a spectrum of autoimmune diseases. Yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, there's, it's one of the big problems in, in talking about GMOs and, and, uh, and topics like this is that it's very difficult to separate correlation this mm -hmm. happened with this mm -hmm. from causality. 
I, which is this causes this, <laughs> and, and, I am, and that's a difficult problem to solve. And I, I am very familiar with that. I'm a, I am, a, as you know, a chemical engineer um, in combustion. Okay. Uh, and but especially early in my, in my career, I was uh, doing product development, uh, emissions control, and yes, you can correlate, you know power plant emissions with the phase of the moon. <laughs> it's important that whatever your model is that you're correlating have some causality to it. Yeah. That you you don't lie to yourself. Yeah, exactly. And that but that that the difficulty of making that distinction has I think complicated the discussion on a lot of topics, including I GMOs. I agree with that. Yeah. So yeah. this goes right into my next question. Um, as I'm aware of, and when I did my research, there's pretty much five um, corporations that do genetically modified organism research. Monsanto, DuPont, Dow, Syngenta, Bayer, BSF. So in 2012, um, according to Farmers Weekly, they basically, uh, the Germany uh, basically banned BASF uh, to grow crops um, in Germany. So now BASF is currently in the United States. So my question is with 94% uh, of soybeans are being grown here in the United States, 93% of canola and other uh, primary food crops in America are GMOs, what is the concern for the consumer? Are they aware that their food, do you think they're aware that their food is uh, being modified? Generally, no. I would, I would say is, is anybody who isn't concerned about it doesn't know about it. <laughs> I think right. that's and, true. <laughs> um, one of the things that is uh, interesting for me or, con or concerning to me as a legislator is what do you do about it? Mm -hmm. Certainly... Uh, Everybody has a right to control what goes into them and to know what they're putting into themselves. Uh, this inspired legislation last term to ban, uh, let's see, to, how did they put it? It was actually to require GMO foods to be, once you had a, a kernel number, I don't remember it was, if it was three or four of the New England states, to... Uh, enact such legislation to require GMO foods to be labeled as GMO. Mm -hmm. Now there's, there's a, a, an inherent danger in that, in that we are a very small market. Mm. If, if I was a, uh, a major food producer and I was going to have to produce special uh, uh, labels to send my food into New Hampshire, I wouldn't send food into New Hampshire. Okay. <laughs> the, la the labeling is too costly. Why bother? Yeah. Yeah. There is the alternative, which is, in, in, ess in essence, a backdoor approach. We as a legislature set what we to to consider to be GMO foods, and we did that. It was a, a far more relaxed uh, standard than, say, the organic food standard. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And simply say, if you are going to say your food is non-GMO, then this is the standard you have to meet. Or no, if you're going to, yeah, if you're going to say your yeah. food is non-GMO. Meet this standard. Meet this standard. Yeah. So then it's, it, it's, a, it's a marketing tool. Okay. And this is how you inspire people to, rather than a, than, than a punishment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's, part of the problem with it is, and I'm sure you're aware of this, Okay, what do you what defines a genetic modification? You know, for the example, the corn that we eat today is not the corn that the pilgrims ate when they came here. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, uh, if you do if you get into cooking too much, you find out that that a lot of the current products that that have wheat, I mean, wheat bread, wheat this, mm -hmm. wheat that, a lot of that has been enabled by a genetic modification of wheat. Mm -hmm. There's the the flour that you use for for wheat products is is what they call a white mm -hmm. wheat as opposed to the original brown wheat mm -hmm. and okay is that a is that a genetic modification that's that's a good yeah. question well and, and and that's what i was saying is most of that was done by hybridization not right. by not yeah. by getting into 
at the cellular level. Well, but hybridization uh, right. is so, a genetic modification. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it, it, so that's where the, uh, the discussion gets pretty blurry. Is mm -hmm. you know all all of the domestic dogs are are hybrids, right? And, and, right. The, and people cause that over yes. the last few thousand years. How is that different? So this is a great intersection into the next question I have for you, uh, Frankenfoods. Um, with them being genetically modified, uh, what is the impact on the environment? That's one of my components. There, there are a lot of impacts. I mean, I, I'm an amateur gardener, vegetable gardener. Mm -hmm. Started really gardening 20 years ago, when we, uh, probably 15 years ago when we moved, after we moved to New Hampshire. It used to be that you always had volunteer tomatoes in the garden, the ones that fell to the ground and in the spring they would sprout up. Probably eight years ago I noticed there were no more volunteer tomatoes because most of the seed tomato, tomato seeds that you bought were genetically uh, modified to resist infections or mm -hmm. to have thick skins or whatever but that neither were they capable of reproduction. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. uh, I've started, in, in my gardening, I use only uh, organic seed. Mm -hmm. Guess what? I have volunteer tomatoes again. Mm -hmm. um, now, is it, is it, do you prefer having volunteer tomatoes, or do you prefer having tomatoes that are more resistant to... I prefer having the volunteer tomatoes. Okay, that's okay. just your call. And, and, and <laughs> my call. And, that's, yeah. and, you know, and I go through, and I make sure of what I'm doing. Yeah. 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 So yeah. with with that, um, the debate becomes okay, the ones that are heirloom tomatoes you're talking right. about and right. and the it isn't even but yeah, but I guess they all are, are what you would call heirloom tomatoes. But I mean you can go to Walmart, you can buy the organic seed. Mm -hmm. Right. From um, what's the big house used to be in uh, Boston oh, Seed House. But it's it's a mainline brand of yeah. seed, and yeah. they sell the the heavy duty seeds, and they sell the organic seeds, mm -hmm. and you just buy what you want. Right. Yeah, yeah. So then the question becomes: Are there health concerns for human consumption? I have health concerns regarding human consumption. Yes. Um, generally speaking, we are designed to eat things that reproduce. On the microbiological level, does that do the same th when you eat the seeds of fruit? And I'm not talking about the flesh. The flesh is just calories. Mm -hmm. But when you eat the seeds of the fruit and it is incapable of reproduction, does it do the same thing in your body? Is it metabolized the same way? I don't know that that's something we can, we're competent to address even. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can tell me better than, you yeah. know, is that something we can uh, mechanistically um, uh, discern? Certainly you could statistically do, you know, double-blind studies and try and figure mm -hmm. out if, mm -hmm. if one group or another did or did not inspire certain diseases. Yeah. Well, the, the fact of the matter is, and this is, there's probably close to 100 years of, of progressive research and on the whole issue of, of how do you get anything into a cell. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're composed of cells, and, right. and, and our individual cells have to take up the nutrients to, mm -hmm. to do, their, do whatever they do. Correct. Okay. Well, it turns out that in our digestive system, to move something from inside your gut into the bloodstream, mm -hmm. you have to go through you a molecule, right. you, you are a nutrient. Of yep. some kind. You have to go through this elaborate process to get admitted. It's, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it turns out that let's say you eat a seed. Well, that's a bunch of DNA and RNA and and, and fifty thousand other things that that only a few scientists mm -hmm. know or care about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but to get those products out of that seed and into your bloodstream, it has to be totally broken down, okay? It has to be, uh, you can't just take an arbitrary clump of material and force it through the intestinal wall. It's got to be certain things. 
Well, it, I don't care what, what led to that seed being the way it is, whatever DNA it's got. The DNA has to be broken down before it can be absorbed. The proteins have to be broken down before they can be absorbed. Every component of that thing, to some extent, has to be broken down into pieces. Okay. To some so, extent. Yeah. And, and, and this is something I remember vividly from my undergraduate uh, chemistry, I actually believe, uh, is that uh, we have, for instance, ascorbic acid, vitamin C. Mm -hmm. And... When you, when it comes out of a plant, and I'm, I don't remember whether which is rotated left or which which mm -hmm. is rotated right. Carbon is an asymmetrical molecule. Right. And when you well, and when you well, have the proteins are. Yeah. Well, and when you have long chains, and when you have ascorbic acid produced na by nature, is rotated one way. Ninety-five percent of mm -hmm. it comes out as rotated mm -hmm. one direction, five percent the other. When you Produce it in the laboratory. It is ninety, approximately ninety-five percent, rotated the other way. Hmm. Your body doesn't absorb the one that's rotated the other yeah. way. It only really right. absorbs what's produced naturally, or ninety-five percent of it. So when when you buy vitamin C from rose hips, your body uses ninety-five percent of it. When you buy vitamin C produced in the laboratory, or chemically. Uh, your body uses 5% of it. So then that goes into a perfect question. Should we ban GMOs based on your example? Um, again, well, first of all, no state, because I'm, I'm a state legislator, a state cannot practicably ban GMOs. Most of food production, particularly in New Hampshire, I suppose Iowa could, uh, but New Hampshire produces the vast, or receives particularly as an end product, most of the food consumed in New Hampshire is produced in other states. They are outside of our jurisdiction. We do not have the capacity to ban the production of that food. That's just a, you know, put your thinking cap on what we are authorized and not authorized to do. That would have to be federal legislation. Um, and I don't know that it would be necessarily wise because again, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, the jury's out. Unfortunately, we're all part of the experiment. Um, and we won't know the end result for generations. Um, things like the cotton that is, you know, that you don't eat cotton. I think that's a grand thing. I mean, when, when you can produce more cotton per square acre and it's not rotted or otherwise corrupted. Um, that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. When it comes to what we are incapable of observing and could affect us materially, I, I, I think there's a question. I think there ought to be the capacity to make the personal decision. Well, that, again, I, I guess to me, the, yeah, whether, what, what, when you try to label something as, as having a certain genetic characteristic, uh, there's just so many factors that we don't know, okay, mm -hmm. in terms of how many other modifications were made to that product before the one you don't like or that you're concerned about, right. okay? Right. So, so when I tell somebody this is genetically modified, well, everything is genetically modified every time it reproduces. And I... You know, so there, to me, that's a that's a pretty shady line. And then if you don't have a good background in in the science of that, does it make any sense? Does it really make any sense to say something's genetically modified? It depends, I would think, on how uh, coarsely or finely you divide the line. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we tried to do in the legislation, uh, or the proposed amendment to the legislation last term was provide a very coarse line that, okay. uh, you know, if you look at the, the standards for organic food, for instance, I mean, that you can't have, you know, a, a minor effect from pollen that blew in from a field 10 miles away. Mm -hmm. We said, that's ridiculous because it's, it's beyond the control. Yeah. 
uh, on the other hand, and I and I don't have it in front of me, and I wish I did, but we we uh, went through and tried to be very sensible about what was within somebody's control. I mean, the the original legislation punished the guy who had on the who owned the store that had a genetically modified food uh, on the on the shelf that wasn't labeled as genetically modified. Mm -hmm. We said, no, that's not yeah. rational. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If if the error is that of the manufacturer, that shouldn't be yeah. carried through yeah. on yeah. the yeah. store owner. That's just not, because yeah. yeah. he, he buys it with some faith. Yeah. So then with that in going through the process, now Pepsi and Coca-Cola um, recently had to put labels late on their cans saying that some of their elements uh, of their beverage is carcinogenic. So do you think our Phil will get to a point here in New Hampshire where uh, legislation will be um, impressed upon the consumer to see labeling in the future of their food? Do you well, think that'll happen? Well, it's, if you if you look close, there's an awful lot of products that are known to the state of California to cause cancer or birth defects. There's an awful lot of stuff that that has done that. Right? I mean, yeah. you see it all the time. Does it make any difference? Does anybody pay any attention? I don't know. Is it even reasonable? I don't. Uh, I guess I would say, if it's within my power, the way. I would say this. Well, I would say bluntly, no. What we proposed was that if you were going to call your food GMO, you had to non-GMO. You had to meet a certain yeah. standard. Yeah. So, in in essence, the the labeling is voluntary. Mm -hmm. okay. So, yeah. no, it was not a sledgehammer. Yeah. It was uh, a fine tool. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to achieve a marketing strategy, yeah. Then you could use that. Then you could use that. Just like organic. And you and you, and you, and you had to you and you had to, uh, and anybody would be able to look look up on the state website and know what that meant. Mm -hmm. And and that, to me, that's a sensible way to do it. Yeah, yeah. That's very different from the from the other from the flip side, which is you've got to say it's genetically modified. Right. And it, and it also is kind of clever because it does sidestep a lot of the issues. And concerns that people have had about well, it's yeah, you know, it's not, it's misleading to say something's GMO because, as we've talked about, depending on where you draw the line, everything is right. So here's something that you can use. yeah, that makes that that would kind of make sense if people want to buy that. That's their business. And they're going to pay a premium for it, just like organic, right? For better or worse. For better or for worse. <laughs> but they but it it adds an element of control, mm -hmm. uh, and they can they can. Just, I mean, do I think there is uh, an issue in eating sugar from genetically, you know, sugar from genetically modified sugar beets? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Yeah. You're you're only eating calories. Yeah. You yeah, know. Yeah. Uh, it, do I think there is some question of risk? I guess you'd say uh, in eating uh, genetically modified nuts. Yeah, could be. You don't know, I mean, uh, so. but there's certainly it's certainly greater than if than considering sugar. Well, I, I guess I guess I kind of fall in the line that that given what I know about the way digestion works, mm -hmm. there's probably very few things that I can do genetically to modify something that would be harmful because of the screening that goes on in our gut to to, for, to what we absorb. You know the the one place where I, some people realize this, that uh, a newborn mammal or human, uh, their gut does allow them to absorb very large molecules mm -hmm. from colostrum. Yep. And if you work with cattle, you know that you have to make that happen or the calf dies or, mm -hmm. or the, the, the young born animal dies. But beyond some early point in life, your, your intestines are are very good at screening out and not laying in things that, that don't fit. I, okay, I'm ahead. curious because you're talking about our intestines. Yeah. And my question is, 
do you, uh, this is for both of you, mm -hmm. um, but specifically to you, uh, you Roy, um, GMOs, are they as dangerous as pesticides? Because a lot of our food has pesticides, and many of these GMOs yeah. have a, 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 an abundant amount of pesticides that are applied to them. So what's your perspective well, on that? Well, I guess, <clears throat> taken in, in order of, of potential harm, just as on, on a global scale, or you know, just taken as a group, herbicides are probably... Uh, between herbicides and insecticides, we are likely to be more likely to be affected by an insecticide than a, than a herbicide because we're closer to a, a insect than a plant. Okay, sure. But between either of those and GMOs, I I have no qualms about the GMO because of what it's doing. Uh, it's not anything toxic. Okay. So maybe you get some. So the question. Well, well, oh, um, let me ask a question here because I'm I, I'm going. I guess you'd say on hearsay. Mm -hmm. Are there food crops that are genetically engineered to produce pesticides uh, within themselves? Yeah, and, and insecticide. But here's the distinction: mm -hmm. is that when a uh, and I don't remember any of the, any of the specific instances but if you if you create a crop that that produces some material that a bug doesn't like so the bug goes away okay so the, the example is the bt corn and the oh. monarch butterflies right okay i, well, I, say, I don't know the details because uh -huh. i'm not in the plants that much but but in general uh, it that substance that is produced by the plant okay in, in response to this additional gene there's a distinction between small molecules, of, and it depends on what field you're in, what's small and what isn't, <laughs> okay? Right. Uh, but the plant makes some kind of enzyme, some complicated biological molecule that chases off the bug. I don't have any problem with that because if it, once it gets to be some biological molecule of some size, my digestive system is going to break that down into its components before I absorb it. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. That, that's cool. And that's certainly better than having some small molecule insecticide put on that plant. That then there's some there's possibly some residue. Now in reality, we know that's not a problem because we all eat these crops all the time and have for our whole life, and we're we're still here, okay. But again, there is a a better chance of an insecticide hurting us than than some additional large product made by the plant okay so yeah so are those um, large molecules made by the plant are those insecticides or are those repellents uh, I think they're I, I'm sorry I don't know the, some of the details and it wouldn't I think for the most part they're a repellent okay mm -hmm. um, it it could be it could be a, a, something that would kill the the insect as well, okay. I now, mean, if it, it could, would kill the insect, why wouldn't it kill us? Because or <clears throat> have a deleterious effect. <clears throat> well, for the the uh, the insect digestive system is quite different. Understood, yeah. but it's still a digestive system. Yeah, yeah, but uh, and it depends on what exactly happens to that once the insect gets a hold of it. I mean, I, I would have to look at some it's, details. It's, uh, each one may be very different because when you go, when you sit down in the lab and you say, I want to I want to build this, you don't know, you may have an idea of how you're going to get there. But as you know, sometimes you, you have to go this route to synthesize something as opposed to this other route. Mm -hmm. So, and so the, I, I would... Right. It, I, I think unless you take a specific one and go through the primary literature and find out exactly what was done and how it works in the insect, and then you don't you don't know. Okay. So my next. I know that there have been farmers that have been sued by like Monsanto because of cross population that's, and. That's absurd. I mean, I, I, that is, and I think that's in the end the farmers have won. Um, they may not have won the first round, but I think in the end they've won. Um, the idea that somebody 
could sue because nature blew their product into a neighbor's yard is and 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 sue them then for having that product without having bought it is is absurd and society uh through the perception of the justice system should quash that as rapidly as possible so uh, if you have the opportunity and this is a knocking on your door like what I would, would you I, do what would i do um I guess the only thing you can do is statutorily is say, is, is, is say that such suits are unallowed in, within our jurisdiction. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it's, well, I suppose it could be an issue here. We grow a lot of summer corn. I know that uh, I grow heritage corn, and, or so-called heritage corn. I grow uh, corn that can reproduce, and I know that, and I, I, I do a very poor job of it. I've, I've never gotten an ear bigger than this. So the corn that I typically eat, I buy from a neighbor who farms in a substantial way, and I know that he pays, I don't know that he, I know he pays no attention to that aspect of the seed. <laughs> so if there is the potential, especially since my sons, especially since my sons uh, are apiaries, and I have three beehives in my backyard, there is certainly the, the potential that his corn could pro cross-pollinate with mine. Mm -hmm. So I would, if that were to ever become an issue in New Hampshire, I would certainly be a champion of legislation that says, no, our cars, courts will not accept such such a suit. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I didn't realize how well that played in. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting because I, I think about the bees and the pollinators and with GMOs, there's been a trend of a decrease um, uh, populations of our pollinators. And that, that's, that, there's other, there's, there's other th factors you think? Oh there's, oh, there's hosts of other factors. I'm not saying it's not a factor. Mm -hmm. I think it could be a factor. No, but the, the but honeybee decline is, is it, they're starting to understand what that is. What, are, are they? It's a pathogen, yeah. Because I mean, there's all. I mean, there's everything from the the mites that mm -hmm. they are typically infested with, mm -hmm. to uh, allegations of microwave interference. Yeah. To uh, I mean, I just the, there's all those correlations, but there's no the, the there's causality, causality is, 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 is elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe maybe elsewhere. The, the, I, unless you can inform me uh, otherwise, I don't know of a of a successful causality yet. On the honeybees? Yeah, yeah, I think there is. I think it's. I, th I think it's. They're either it's totally nailed down or it's close to a a uh, malady, uh, an illness. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know. Uh, it's, there's there's something in in trend, and I, I again I don't have the details, but there's something. That they're focusing down to some sp specific aspect of the bee and the and the agent that's causing it. Yeah, that's probably the best way to say it. There, there is a narrowing of focus as to what the agent is. Yeah. And then there's just weather. Yeah, yeah. bad luck. I mean, we, my my uh, my sons had a uh, partic particular variant of bee. They're Italian bees, and uh, they overpopulated and did not have enough honey to make it through the winter last winter. And it was a particularly cold winter, so they needed more honey. Yeah, yeah. So they, yes. they just ate yeah. themselves out of house and home and were dead by mid-January. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. But and yeah. I learned that a large number of apiaries in New Hampshire lost their bees last winter. Mm. Okay. Well, that, <coughs> excuse me, the... the it's kind of a long stretch to to say that any time you have a GMO crop, it's going to be propagated elsewhere. Because again, as is well known, the a lot of the genetically modified crop seeds won't reproduce. And that's true. Yeah. So it may be <laughs> to some extent there's some self-limiting, but which isn't to say you can't take one specific piece of that characteristic and transfer it to something that will reproduce. But it's it's certainly not a given that that the genetically modified crop 
is going to show up everywhere. Right. 